Okay, so today we talk about the supersymmetry. Um, the, the literature from which I took most of the day, day lecture it goes back to these two sources. Uh, the first one is the is is the book by Dries, Scott Bell and Roy. It's theory of phenomenology of particles. And uh, actually, the 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 length, the size of this book tells you how big the subject is. Okay. Uh, and and the the second resource is is the the lectures on physics beyond the standard model, which focuses on the connection and and the solution to the hierarchy problem. Okay. Uh, talking about supersymmetry, we start by continuous symmetries in quantum field theory. So the continuous symmetries are, for example, the, the space-time symmetry um, and internal symmetries, where the internal symmetries can be either global or, or local. Local gauge, it means gauged. For instance, in the standard model, we have the, 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 the Poincaré symmetry, which is the, 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 the full space-time symmetry. And then we have the gauge symmetry, which is the internal local symmetry, which is the product of um, SU3 color, SU2 left, and U1 hypercharge. I gave you examples of, of continuous symmetries in the standard model, which is the Poincaré symmetry and the gauge symmetry. And now I talk about the, the Lie algebra. The defining relation between Lie algebra is this commutator relation. So the, the two elements of the algebra, which I call here TA and TB, there is a relation, Lie bracket, which is the, the commutator. This is a linear combination of the, of the elements inside the algebra. F, A, B, C are the structure constants with, which define the, the, the algebra. And, and these elements are called the generators of the symmetry. Why? Because when you exponentiate the generators in this way, where alpha A are some continuous parameters, hence a continuous symmetry. So alpha A are real numbers. Um, we get the group transformation. A symmetry is invariance under these transformations. So when you do this transformation, you get um, the, the thing stays the same, that, that is the symmetry. All right, so um, the key concept here are these algebras. So let's go back to the Poincaré group and Poincaré algebra. So the Poincaré group is the, is the group which transforms the, 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 the space-time in this way. So the 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 homogeneous the, the the inhomogeneous part is corresponds to the translations in fact there are four generators of translations and then there is this part which corresponds to the lorentz group um, these are four dimensional um, matrices and they are anti, it's an anti symmetric matrix. So it has six degrees of freedom. In particular, the, the transformations that it uh, encodes are three rotations, so in, in space, and three boosts. Okay. So in total, point carry symmetry has um, three plus three plus four generators. And the, the general transformation. Is given by this formula where a mu and omega mu nu are the parameters which define the, the group element. Okay. Continuous parameters which define the group element. And p mu and m mu nu are the generators of the, of the transformation, elements of the, of, the, of the algebra. So how does this algebra look like? <clears throat> um, it's given here by these three equations. Uh, the first one is the commutator of the, of the, of the translations. So these are space-time translations and, and it's zero. The, the third one is 
the commutator of the Lorentz generators. Note, notice that the commutator of the Lorentz generators is the linear combination of themselves, meaning that the this is the Lorentz, Lorentz this is subalgebra of the of the full Poincaré algebra. This is the Lorentz algebra. In fact, um, we are considering only so proper orthogonal Lorentz group. So we we are considering only um, transformations which are uh, continuously connected to the identity transformation. Also notice here that there is a the second relation which mixes translation and Lorentz generators under commutation. It gives the linear combination of the of the translation generator. So it's a non-trivial. Um, uh, relate non-trivial non way of combining translation and rotations and boosts. All right, so this is the point card algebra and it is really the basis of um, the way we understand the space time and it is the basis of the standard model. So um, one one, one thing when, when we talk about the, the full continuous symmetry of the standard model is this direct sum. So the, the direct sum of Lie algebras, G1 and G2, is defined in this way. So um, the, direct sum, the elements of the direct sum are ordered pair X and Y, where X belongs to um, GX and, and Y belongs to GY. And the defining uh, Lie bracket simply says that the 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 first the, the first uh, term in the in the, uh, the element will be just the, the 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 commutator under GX, okay. So you take uh, x1, x2 under GX, and you do the, the commutator, and likewise for y. It's a very trivial way. So in particular, GX and GY um, commute with each other. This is the direct sum of algebras. And it's a linear, it's a trivial way to stick algebras together. That is what we have in the standard model. So the full uh, Lie algebra is the product of the Poincaré one for the space time and then times the, the internal one for the gauge symmetries and maybe some other global symmetries. <coughs> Um, well, 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 simple example. So let's, um, the illustration of this uh, se separation, for, for example, let, let's consider the gluon field. The gluon field, uh, so first of all, it's a field, so it depends on the space-time coordinate. Then it has two, two, two indices. One is A, which is the color index. So the, the gluon is a adjoint representation of SU3 color. And the color index goes from one to eight. And the second one is mu, which is the space-time index. Gluon field is a, is a vec four vector. It's the vector representation of the, of the uh, Lorentz group. So under Lorentz transformation shown here, the, the, the color index is untouched. So you're just, uh, you know, but you're just doing the transformation on, this, on, the, on, the, the, on the Lorentz indices. And likewise, when you perform a color, color uh, rotation, uh, which here depends on X because it's a local, it's a local transformation, then you don't touch the, the Lorentz index. Okay. So, it's a, so it's, a, it's a very trivial way to separate the different uh, symmetries. So the question which, um, we want to ask here is that is, is the following: Can space-time and internal symmetries be com combined in a non-trivial way? That's the question. So that there is this famous theorem, which goes under the name of Coleman-Mandula theorem from '67, um, with the answer being no. The full Lie algebra. Um, pertaining to all continuous symmetries of the S matrix, S matrix being the, 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 um, the, 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 the scattering ma the, the, the scattering matrix um, of the theory, 
so the the full Lie algebra of that describes uh, all continuous symmetries and including Lie subalgebra Poincare and any other internal symmetry must be a direct product. Okay. In particular, this has to hold. As we saw, for example, in the standard model. Okay, so the, the most general cont continuous symmetry, um, which is uh, Lie algebra, okay, that, that is the caveat. If, you, if you, the continuous symmetry is Lie algebra, then the most general one, um, if it includes a subalgebra point carré and any other, then it has to be a direct sum. Um, so this uh, this is ba this is based on some um, reasonable assumptions to have like in, in, interacting uh, theory with the finite dimensional representations and so on. So it's a quite general result in, in quantum field theory. So supersymmetry actually um, evades the theorem. Doesn't it, it evades this theorem? by going beyond the Lie algebras. So supersymmetry algebra is not, um, a, it's not a, a Lie algebra, okay? Actually, it is something which is called Z2 graded Lie algebra. And this, this, this Z2 graded Lie algebra um, in simple words means that the, there are, in addition to commutation relations, there are also anti-commutation relations. In fact, there are two types of generators, um, even and odd uh, under Z2. And the, the, uh, the even generators, so this one here, the, this is just uh, you know, the, the ordinary Lie algebra for the even generators, they obey the ordinary Lie algebra. And the odd generators, they, uh, when they, the commutator with the even generator gives um, an odd generator and the anti-commutator uh, gives the an even generator. So the, what, what the anti-commutation is, is basically this relation. So this is the, the uh, uh, in some literature, this symbol is equivalent to, to this kind of brackets, okay? So this is the anti-commutation, uh, uh, the anti-commutator. Okay. So there is um, a, another theorem from 75 by, by Haag, uh, Lapuzansky and Zonius, which says the following, the most general continuous symmetry of the S matrix consistent with the column and mandula theorem is that pertaining to a Z2 graded Lie algebra where the odd generators, okay? So the odd generators belong to spin one half representation of the Lorentz group. While the even generators are just the, 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 the usual direct sum of Poincaré and any other internal symmetry. Okay. So this kind of underlying structure for the continuous symmetry of the S matrix, it gives a, a, a consistent quantum field theory. And now the fundamental question is at this point, um, the fun really the fundamental question about nature is, is supersymmetry realized? Okay. Uh, let me quickly remind you of the Lorentz group representations, given that the odd generator, the supersymmetry generator is um, spin one half representation of the Lorentz group, just to explain a bit better what this means. So the, the, the Lorentz group co contains rotations and boosts, okay? So these are in particular uh, rotations and these are boosts, these are some specific elements of this of the m mu nu tens uh, generator 
so we do the we do the the the, the red redefinition, and we can basically um, write down the algebra, the Lorentz group, as the direct sum of the two algebras. So you see, these J plus generators form an algebra on, on their own, uh, the same as the J minus, and the commutator between the two, two is zero, meaning that it's a, it's a, a trivial combination of the two. So the, the, the Lorentz algebra, is basically this um, the combination of the SU2 plus and SU2 minus. So SU2, uh, we, we know how to deal with um, finite dimensional um, representations. They are basically half integer spins. Integer and half integer, integer and half integer spins. Um, and the representation of the Lorentz group is the ordered pair J plus J minus, where J plus is the representation under SU2 plus and J minus under SU2 minus. Okay, so this is the, the representation, finite dimensional representation of the Lorentz group. So the, the, the theorem, which um, um, evades uh, the Coleman Mandula theorem, the, the supersymmetry uh, theorem says that the odd generators from the from the Z2 graded um, Lie algebra are actually in one, one half comma zero or zero comma one half the representation of the Lorentz group. These are um, left chiral and right chiral vial spinners respectively. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Uh, this is studied when you study fermions in quantum field theory. You study while uh, spinners. Um, the Dirac spinner is the direct sum of these two irreducible representation. So it's a, it's a so this this representation is uh, reducible. It can be reduced as a direct sum of left and, and right chiral spinners. All right. So the um, the Z two odd generator of the super um, algebra. Um, we will call it Q, and it carries this index A, and this index is in the Dirac space, okay, in the spinner space. It's a spinner index, which go one, two, three, four. So we will take a minimal choice, meaning um, to take one while spinner, and um, we can, out of one while spinner, we can make um, a Majorana spinner. A Majorana spinner um, we, we can make by the charge uh, by imposing the charge conjugation. So saying that the the charge conjugate is the the charge conjugation in, on the spinner, and this is basically the uh, encoded in this um, C matrix. Okay, it's encoded in this C matrix. <clears throat> this is just a minimal choice. Um, and this is this is called n equal one supersymmetry. So we have only one uh, additional odd generator. Uh, you can have n equal two, n equal three, four, and so on, as many as you wish to put in. Uh, in fact, n equal four supersymmetry is, is a very important um, um, example in studied in theoretical physics. For the moment, we will stick to n equal one supersymmetry. And we, so our generator is, is a four, you can think of it as a four component um, spinner, four component spinner. Um, it will in fact be a Majorana spinner satisfying this uh, equation, satisfying this equation, which means that the spinner, the, the charge, it's, the spinner is equal to its charge conjugate. <clears throat> okay. So this is the super point carré algebra. So the super Poincaré algebra. Um, so it consists of the Poincaré algebra plus these three additional um, relations. And so the, the third one you should forget for the moment and focus only on the on the first um, three. So Q is the odd generator of the Z2 graded Lie algebra. 
Um, P and M are the translations and Lorentz generators um, <coughs> of, the, of the Poincaré algebra. So the first equation says that the anti-commutator of the, of the two odd generators gives translations, space-time translations. The second equation says that the, 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 the odd generator commutes with the, um, with the space-time translations. And the, the last equation says that the odd generator is, uh, is, is, is some representation under, this, uh, un under the, the, the Lorentz transformation. Okay, so I will call this odd generator from now on a supercharge because it's a, um, it's a generator of supersymmetry and it really is a, a charge um, in another sense. So let's start with the, with the, with the last uh, relation, which is this relation. So this uh, sigma is basically in terms of gamma matrices in Dirac space is the commutator of the gamma matrices, sigma mu nu. And if you remember this from, from, the, from, from Dirac um, uh, spinners, uh, this is the, the representation of the Lorentz group, the, the spinner representation of the Lorentz group. Or in other words, um, this equation here is how the, 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 the field transforms. You take a fermionic field, it's an operator, and you do um, a transfer, Lorentz transformation, then um, this is the, the, the form of it. I mean, so it, these are um, sigma mu nu are the generators and uh, omega mu nu is the, um, omega mu nu is the, the, the group elements, okay, parameters. So if you take the infinitesimal um, limit, so saying that these omegas are infinitesimally small and you expand this equation, you would get the algebra. So what does this mean? It's basically our defini definition that, uh, that the, the Q, the supercharge is um, this particular representation of the Lorentz group, spin one half um, uh, fermion. So supercharge is not, 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 not a field, it, it's just a, a, a fermion, okay? <clears throat> there is no X, so there is no, um, um, okay. So, so this, this relation just tells us that the supercharge is, is, uh, is a spin one half fermion, okay? So now um, the second point, we saw that the supercharge commutes with the, with the, 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 the space-time translations. This has a consequence that the components of the super multiplet, so states in a super multiplet will be mass degenerate. will have the same mass. So you put bosons and fermions in the super multiplet, they will have the same mass. Why? Because the, the Casimir P square uh, commutes with the with the with the supercharge. <clears throat> the same holds for other usual internal symmetries, for example, gauge symmetry. So the the generator of the gauge symmetry commutes with the supercharge, and therefore uh, the, um, the 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 particles within a super multiplet will have the same quant the internal quantum numbers. Okay. Um, okay, and and the third point is the um, is related to the to this um, algebra this this re al relation, um, and the, one can derive from this relation basically that within a super multiplet there has to be an equal number of fermionic and bosonic degrees of freedom. So, Q Q is 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 a spinner. Now, when it acts on a boson, 
it will give a fermion. This is just a, to, to be Lorentz um, Lorentz symmetry. This is a, a spin. It's a and also Q when it acts on a fermionic state, it will give a boson state. So Q is this uh, um, generator of supersymmetry which um, takes um, one one component of the supermultiplet bosonic one and transform it into fermionic one. And this equation, this anti-commutator, tells you that. Um, um, being proportional to the translations tells you that um, you should have an equal number of fermionic and bosonic degrees of freedom in a supersymmetric multiplet. Okay. So are there any questions at this point related to the super point carry algebra? Uh, yes, Admir, I would have just a question on the last point. So I, I didn't get um, this connection. So from the from the yeah from this anti-commutation relation, does this follow that when Q acts on a fermion, you get a boson? Or... Yeah. So so that there is a lengthy there is a lengthy um, uh, derivation of this result. I'm just uh -huh. stating this yeah. result. Yes. So so um, yeah. Oh, okay. So this algebraic relation tells you that there is an equal number of fermionic and bosonic degrees of freedom in a supermultiplet. This one tells you that within a supermultiplet, of course, when supersymmetry is preserved, the, the, the particles, the states are mass degenerate. And furthermore, they have the same uh, internal quantum numbers under the, for example, gauge symmetry. They are in the same rep representation of the internal symmetry. And this one, uh, this, uh, this relation of the uh, of the super pointer algebra tells you it's simply a defining relation for QA uh, of, 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 of the of the of the supercharge saying that the supercharge is a, a spin real representation spin one half representation of the Lorentz group okay mm -hmm. so maybe these three things is worth remembering about the um, about the super point carry algebra that underlines the the, the, the supersymmetry. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so the, 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 there is this subtlety about the, the global symmetry of the algebra. Uh, if you remember, there was a fourth relation which um, does not belong to the algebra, but uh, it's, um, it is the following. So um, in particular, one can, uh, one can notice that the, 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 the algebra is has a, a global symmetry, okay? The algebra has a global symmetry U1. In particular, when you change the field in this way, with this chiral um, uh, gamma five chiral uh, way, then um, you have all these relations invariant, meaning they stay the same, okay? So the, in particular, this one and that one and that one. So, so in particular, meaning that there is some, um, some unitary generator R, which commutes with the, um, with the point carré generators. However, it, is in a, it, it, it has this um, non-trivial uh, commutation with the, with the supercharge. And this, this last equation simply follows from, from these two things. Okay, so the, the, the super algebra has this UNR um, global symmetry. W w why is it good for? It's just a minor, it's a, it's a technical detail which um, I want to go quickly through. So first of all, this UNR cannot be a symmetry of nature. It, it is, um, uh, it's, it's anomalous and in broken by some interactions. However, um, there is a discrete subgroup of it so, so meaning the UNR is just the symmetry of the algebra, but not necessarily of, La, of Lagrangian, okay? So there is um, a related uh, discrete subgroup of it, which is called Z2 discrete subgroup. So um, U1 is a continuous group, uh, uh, Z2 is a discrete group, subgroup, which is called R parity. And this R parity could be the symmetry of, of um, of uh, Lagrangian, it, it will play a, a, a role in MSSM. So in particular, ordinary particles 
to give you to jump a little bit ahead will be even under this R parity, while their super partners will be odd. And for example, the lightest supersymmetric particle cannot decay. It will be protected. Its decay will be protected by this R parity, uh, which uh, means that that thing could be, for example, a candidate for dark matter or something like that. So just, just to keep in mind the existence of this global U1R, which leads to R parity. Okay. Okay, any, any uh, questions about this? Okay, if not, I will uh, move to the, the super multiplet, a particle super multiplet. So, um, I first want to remind you how we classify particles. We do this by the so-called the little group of the Poincaré symmetry. Um, the, the little group is a subgroup of the Poincaré symmetry, which leaves the chosen for uh, particle momentum invariant. So remember that uh, you, if you, so you want to classify the states uh, under Poincaré symmetry. And, and, and the, the momentum, the four vector of the uh, energy and momentum is a continuous parameter. So these are infinite dimensional representations. So, so how do you do this? You choose a, a momenta and then you identify a little group. A little group is a subgroup of all Poincaré, Poincaré transformations, which would keep this momentum fixed it, invariant, okay? So for example, if you have a massive particle, you can go to its mass frame and uh, where it doesn't move. So if, and then the, the, the subgroup, uh, the little group will be simply 3D rotations, which is uh, SU2 or SO3. This is the little group in the massive case. And we know how to classify representation. It is, this, this is spin, okay? In particular, in the irreducible representation, we have two J plus one states. So the, for the massive particle, you say the, the four vector for the momentum, and then you, have the, you say the spin, okay? In the massless case, uh, you can choose the four vector to be something like this. So there is a, a preferred direction and the the, the remaining little group, this is a bit of a simplification, uh, but uh, after the dust settles, it turns out to be U1 or SO2. So you can think of rotations in the perpendicular plane um, with respect to the axis of motion. And uh, now we talk about the projection on the, we talk about the projection of the, um, spin on the axis of motion, which is called, this quantity is called helicity, H. So for massless case, we have the quantity which is called helicity. So if you want to classify, say the, say the particle, then you say it's momentum, massless particle, and it's helicity. Um, irreducible representation have only one state with helicity H. Particular photon can be, uh, left polarized, photon is a massless particle, it can be left polarized or it can be right polarized. These are two, um, um, two actually these are two irreducible representations. The their direct sum is the photon under the, 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 the little group, okay? Um, in other words, we classify the representation of the Poincaré under the Casimirs, and the two Casimirs we have in mind are the uh, built from the four vector momenta and from the Pauli Lubansky uh, four vector. And these are these two Casimirs, P square and W square, which gives us the. Okay. Yes. So it, it goes this way. So you see that these rotations play a role in defining the, the, the spin or helicity of the particle. So let's go to the supersymmetric case. Remember in, that we have this relation in the supersymmetry algebra. Um, 
and mu nu is are the Lorentz generators. So let's pick a massless case because it's easier. So if we are in the massless case, we, we, we identify the little group, which will be this, uh, um, we, we identify the little group, okay? It will, and then the generator of the little group uh, will be this uh, J3. The, the projection of the spin on the axis of motion, and it measures the helicity of the particle. Okay, now uh, when you start from this relation here, you can arrive to this relation here. This, the, 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 the two relations just follow from the defining algebra. And please have a look carefully as the, these two relations, what, what they tell you. So what this means is that when, you, when Q, the supercharge, acts on a state in a supermultiplet, it lowers the helicity by one half. These equations should remind you, for example, of these um, um, creation and annihilation operators that you encounter, for instance, in the, um, in the discussion of the SU2 representations and the <clears throat> So Q, is this clear, this point, that Q, when it acts on, on, on a state in a supermultiplet, will lower uh, its uh, helicity by one half? Or, or conversely, if Q bar, the, the conjugate one, acts on, on the state, it will uh, increase the helicity by one half. To me, that's clear, yeah. OK, thank you. Um, so one technical thing, remember that Q had um, indices, et cetera. The, one can show that in the massless case, bit of uh, algebra, there is only a single Q with, and the Q bar, which obeys these relations. This is a specific to massless case. Um, and, uh, and, and what follows from this is that, for example, Q squared is zero. Why? So Q obeys the um, Q, Q obeys the anti-commutation uh, relations. For example, this one, and this one says that Q times Q plus Q times Q is zero, meaning that Q squared is zero. Okay. So this means that there are only two states in the in the in the massless supermultiplet. So. Take, for example, the, the highest helicity state J0 and act on it with Q. This will lower the state. It will give the, this state, which has um, a helicity lowered by one half. Now act again with Q. This means Q squared. This is zero. So you, are, you created your um, multiplet. So a massless supermultiplet has two states with the J0 and J0 minus one. Okay, this is just a massless case. Massive case is, um, I will not do it. It's a bit more complicated, of course. And um, you can find it, for example, in this book. It's done in great details. So I want to then talk about um, um, massless supermultiplets. Uh, in terms of this J0, in terms of the, the helicity of the highest state. So this table basically summarizes different supermultiplets of massless particles, okay? So if you pick, for instance, J0 equal one half, okay? So that then the highest component will be one half fermion, spin one half fermion, okay? Uh, it will be a while fermion. It can be either left or right. So these are usually complex uh, representations under internal symmetries. So uh, how many degrees of freedom are there in a while fermion? Uh, while fermion has two degrees of freedom. So it, you can have for in while, let's say if you have a psi L, a while fermion, then, the, this will describe, uh, for example, um, 
left-handed electron and the right-handed positron. So these two states will be created or annihilated by a Weyl fermion. Okay. So what is the other component? Um, so this is J0, that's the, high, the, 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 the highest state. And then we act with the supercharge, it will lower the helicity and we will have this one. It's a complex scalar. Okay. It's a complex scalar. It, it is so, so in, in a chiral, this is the so-called chiral supermultiplet. The chiral supermultiplet contains a, a vile fermion and a complex scalar. Both of them have the same number of degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom are two and two, okay? Is it clear why, so, so complex scalar um, has, the, has the, the, the real part and the imaginary part, okay? But for vile fermion, which is a, a two-dimensional spinner, uh, you could say that, so it has, okay. While fermion you, is a two-dimensional spinner, so you can say that, that perhaps it has four degrees of freedom, but this is, um, oh, in fact, not true. That the, the onshell, there are only two onshell degrees of freedom. And this follows from the fact that the, 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 the Weyl equation or the Dirac equation is, uh, is first order differential e equation. And, um, uh, when, when in classical uh, field theory, you count the degrees of freedom. So you have the, the, the generalized coordinate, generalized uh, coordinate, and then the, the conjugate coordinate. Um, they are one degree of freedom. But, and, and for, uh, for uh, the scalar field, indeed they are independent because one is Q and the other one is Q dot. And the, the Klein-Gordon equation is a second order differential equation. But for Dirac uh, um, equation, which is first order, actually the, the, co the conjugate momenta is not independent. It's something like, um, yeah, it's related to Q. So in fact, um, we don't have four, uh, so we have four real parameters in the vile two-dimensional spinner, but in fact, we have two degrees of freedom. All right. So the, the, in addition to the chiral supermultiplet, there are also, um, yeah, for different J0, let's say take J0 equal one or J0 equal two, we get what is called gauge supermultiplet or supergravity multiplet and equal one su, 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 supergravity multiplet. Um, in particular, gauge supermultiplet, it has, um, okay, Particles which have spin either one or one half, and the helicity can be plus minus. Um, and uh, so, so what are these? So we have spin one gauge boson. Spin one gauge boson is the highest state, and then uh, the spin one half fermion. So there is spin one gauge boson and spin one half fermion. And this fermion is actually a Majorana fermion. So um, a Majorana fermion is built from one vile spinner. So it means it has uh, two degrees of freedom. These degrees of freedom are basically particle of some helicity and uh, particle of, of other helicity because Majorana uh, particle is the same as anti-particle. Um, spin one gauge boson is uh, in massless case, so it's just like a photon. So it has a left polarized and, and right polarized. So again, there are two degrees of freedom for the bosonic and two degrees of freedom for the fermionic uh, part. Okay. So the, the chiral supermultiplet and gauge supermultiplet are very important for MSSM. I won't talk much about supergravity. Multiple. Um, so the um, <clears throat> so some important points is that the chiral supermultiplet. It is a complex representation of the internal symmetries like gauge symmetry, while uh, the the gauge supermultiplet is a real representation. When supersymmetry breaks, so we haven't observed. Uh, 
electron super partner to be to have the mass of 0.5 MeV. We haven't seen any super partner at the moment. So supersymmetry is clearly broken in nature. And therefore, uh, when you break supersymmetry, you split, you split the, the multiplet. So some, some states are heavier, some are uh, lighter. But you don't have to uh, break the internal symmetry. So supersymmetry breaking will split the super multiplet in terms of mass, but will not necessarily break the internal symmetry. Okay, the, the gauge symmetry within a, a multiplet, for example, stays the same. Okay. Okay, I will show this slide and perhaps we can have a, a, a sh short break after this. So in the MSSM, <clears throat> um, matter fields being uh, quarks and leptons, they fit into a chiral supermultiplet. So the, fer the fermion of the of the, the, the standard, you know, fermionic matter, there will be an additional states super, which supersymmetry introduces, they, the so-called their super partner, which we called spermion, okay? And uh, they will be scalars. So this will be spin zero scalar. Also, the Higgs is a, in chiral supermultiplet. There will be a partner of the Higgs, which we call Higgsino. And the, the Higgsino will be a fermion. It will be one half spin. Okay. Higgsino will be a fermion. Fermion is a scalar and Higgsino is a fermion. And they sit in the chiral supermultiplet. And then there is a gauge supermultiplet which uh, which describes forces. So the the gauge bosons, they are spin one. Uh, their their partner will be uh, gaugeino. Gaugeino is spin one half. Okay. Okay, that, that's basically how it works in the, in the MSSM. And then uh, finally, the, the sparticles, supersymmetric pa uh, partners, they have R parity minus one. And ordinary particles, they have R parity pl uh, plus one. Okay. Any questions? And yeah before we close the first uh, class. Uh, yes. that, sorry, you go first. Mm -hmm. okay, sorry. So just about this R parity, how do we know that ordinary particles must have R parity plus one and S particles minus one? Ah, so, so you have to define uh, um, what precisely this discrete Z2 of the, of the original U1R is. Um, and then you have to give the to these um, guys uh, the. Um, I mean, then you have the you have to give to these different chiral supermultiplets this R number, and then um, turns out there is a choice in such a way that the different that the the super particles are uh, odd and that this one is even. Oh, okay, okay. So, so it will, um, yeah. This actually is a rather trivial uh, to show when you start from the from the, the algebra. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. I would have a question about the massless uh, particles that you showed before. The massless uh, super multiplet. Yes, okay? exactly. So mm -hmm. there are three possibilities for J zero. So can all of these be? Uh, can J0 be all of these three cases? So can it be in total 12 massless particles or does one have to choose one of these possibilities? Uh, so these are different irreducible representations. They are different entities. Um, so for example, for example, in the MSSM, in the MSSM, you put uh, gluon. Gluon will be 
uh, gluon will be one gauge super multiplet. The other one be, would be, let's say, um, WA, the, 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 the so, sorry, the gauge bosons of the SU2 and the, the B, the gauge bosons of U1. This will be three different uh, uh, gauge super multiplets. Like in the standard model, you have a gluon field, you have a W field, you have a B field. So now you will have a G super multi gauge super multiplet, W gauge super B. Regarding the the uh, the chiral super multiplets, all the fermions Q, U, D, E, L, they are different chiral super multiplets. Furthermore, they collect they carry flavor index. I goes from one to three which are separate uh, uh, chiral supermultiplets. Okay, I think I understand. Thanks. Okay. All right, so let, let's make a very short break. All right, so that was the discussion of the particle supermultiplet, but we want to eventually do quantum field theory. So we want to dis uh, talk about fields and um, um, write down Lagrange and, and yeah, formulate the theory in this way. There is the concept of superspace. We, we enlarge the the, the 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 space sort of with super algebra, non-trivial non, non way to combine so more general, you know, space time, and, uh, space time and internal symmetry. So um, we can introduce the concept which is called the superspace. So the superspace uh, will enlarge the space time. And there will be super coordinates. And the super coordinates will have the usual coordinates, usual space time coordinates. And it will have, in addition, the fermionic coordinates. These are uh, Grassmann numbers, OK? This theta a and the, uh, a dot. Um, here I will, I will switch to the so-called two component spinner notation. Remember that my supercharge was a four component Majorana spinner, but in fact, it is only this, um, uh, uh, yeah, these two component uh, wild spinners, where this dotted index A and A dotted, I use these dotted and undotted indices. So this um, theta, I can do products of these thetas, which is Lorentz invariant. For example, this product here, theta square. Uh, remember, so the, this theta is the is this, the the vial representation. So remember that you can use Levi Civita um, epsilon to 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 write down Lorentz invariant quantity. So this is a, this is one of those. And in particular, note that for ordinary numbers, this, this would be zero, right? If these were ordinary numbers this thing would be zero, but here it's not the case, okay? Um, because these are anti-commuting numbers. Okay. Okay, so these are super coordinates in super space. So we can do, just like we do the, 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 the transformation of the co coordinates, space-time coordinates under Poincaré symmetry, we can do the transformation of the super coordinates under supersymmetry. So this is a, these are super coordinates and you perform a super symmetry. This is how the first component changes, second and third. So a, a infinitesimal SUSY transformation epsilon, okay? All right, so now you can, uh, that's your space has bosonic, the usual coordinates and fermionic um, uh, um, coordinates. Now you can do super fields. A super field will be a function of super space coordinates. And one important thing before I start discussing uh, different types of super fields is that so a super field it depends on the on the super coordinates is that you can sort of expand the um, this field the most general super field, you can expand, um, you can tailor expand in the in these Grassmann or fermionic coordinates. Um, the reason being that um, 
that expansion will be finite. You will have only a finite number of terms. So for example, take theta one, theta one square will be zero because theta, so I, I choose a specific component of the, of, the, of the theta, theta one. So since it's a Grassmann number, it's squ squared is zero because it's an anti-commuting number. So we are going back to the, um, to the definition. So when you do this expansion, there will be terms, there will be some number of terms, but it, it will be a finite number, not too many. We'll have this finite number of terms and those terms will be just, a, uh, so the, the coefficients will, which multiply those terms will be just a function of space time, which means those coefficients in the expansion in theta and theta bar will be um, ordinary fields. Depend, functions of ordinary coordinates, space-time coordinates. So that's the, that is about, uh, so the most general uh, superfield. Now, if you uh, multiply two superfields, you will get a superfield again, because, uh, um, because, you know, again, you have this expansion in, 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 um, in the, um, Taylor expansion in the, in the, in the Grassmann uh, coordinates. So it will, any function has to have that form. Even the product of the two functions will have that form. So it's a, it's a general, uh, that, that general function will cause superfield. Now there are irreducible representations, meaning um, under supersymmetry, of course, meaning, uh, meaning a subset of, the, of these general functions of coordinates. One irreducible representation is the chiral superfield. It has a very specific form, which is this one. So this is a left chiral superfield and the right chiral superfield, okay? This Y is given by this uh, formula here. So what, what does it have? <clears throat> so it, 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 is only, it, it only has these two terms linear in theta and theta square and, and no theta. So it only has these terms, the, 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 the left chiral superfield. Okay. For example, it doesn't have a term which is theta, theta, theta bar, theta bar. This is a perfectly legitimate term, but it, it's not there in the chiral um, superfield. <clears throat> Now, so what are the coefficients of these, uh, of these um, terms? So the, this, this thing here is, um, is a complex scalar field. Phi is a complex scalar field. So it's a spin zero particle and antiparticle. This guy here is a fermion. Why? Because um, Theta, theta is fermion and you, you need to have a Lorentz scalar. So this psi is a fermion. So it's also a field, so it's a wild field. What does it mean? So it's a spin one half, and then it has a, a left-handed particle and the right-handed antiparticle. And there is another scalar, this f, which, which, which in fact I will show is, um, an auxiliary field, meaning it doesn't have on shell degrees of freedom. Okay, so uh, so uh, so chiral supermultiplet that we introduced uh, before is actually uh, related to the chiral superfield. Now you can do the the, the Susy transformation on the on the chiral. So you can do the Susy transformation of the chiral superfield. And this is how each component individually um, change, transforms. This is a very important point here. The F term, okay, uh, is uh, invariant up to a total space-time for, for derivative. So the, the F term, transforms into itself plus a total derivative. So this can be used to, to construct the Lagrangian because we know if, um, 
SUS invariant uh, action. We can th this leads to a SUS invariant action. So if um, if in the Lagrangian we have a transformation up to a total derivative, when we do the integral over the entire space time, that that term with the total derivative will go away. It will be just the surface term where the fields uh, die out at at, at large distances. So. The important point is that the F term can be used to construct SUS invariant actions. What is the F term? So it's basically the, um, the coefficient of the theta square or theta bar square, if you talk about the right chiral uh, superfield. So what I mean by, by this um, <coughs> can be used to construct Lagrangian. So let's let's, take several chiral fields and multiply them. For example, here I, I'm taking three chiral fields and I multiply them. Uh, you can show that basically that the product of these things will be a chiral superfield again, meaning that it will have a, um, meaning that it will have theta and theta square and, um, and this just a normal number. So it will, you, you can factorize different terms into these three. So this one, that one, and this one. The, that form of, the, of this general function is the chiral superfield. Um, so in particular, the F term, the, the last one, the F term now contains, um, for example, Yukawa interactions. These are Yukawa interactions. Remember, Xi is a fermion, and this Xi is another fermion, and this is a scalar. So we have fermion, fermion, scalar. This is a Yukawa interaction, for instance. So you can take the F term, meaning the coefficient of this theta square piece of this triple product of chiral um, superfields, to be your term in Lagrangian. It's SUSE invariant. However, the product of the uh, um, this combination of f dagger f of phi dagger phi, the conjugate one, phi dagger phi, dagger is the, the, the Hermitian conjugate. <clears throat> this is not a chiral superfield. So, so look, the, 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 this is, um, um, remember chiral superfield would have this term. It would have um, this term. It would have, uh, where is the F term? It would have the, the, this term. This would be a left chiral superfield, okay? This term, and this term would be in the in the right chiral superfield. But then there are, uh, you see, there are there are other terms which, uh, yeah, there, there there are other terms. Um, for example, there is this term which has theta square, whatever, which is theta square, theta bar square. This is called the D term. And in fact, now you can do the, the, the SUSE transformation of the general, this I guess is the general uh, superfield, the general function of the, of the super, of the coordinates. Um, and when you do the transformation of the, the SUSE transformation, then you can show that this term, the D term, the D term, which is the coefficient in front of theta square, theta bar square, that one changes up to a total derivative. Under supersymmetry, it changes up to a total derivative, which is this formula here. Meaning that you can also use a D term uh, you can use a D term uh, to, to construct SUSE invariant actions or Lagrangians, to, to construct Lagrangians which lead to SUSE invariant actions. Um, so, so this D term and F term is something which is used to, to, um, to write down the, 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 the theory. F terms are usually called the uh, superpotential. And this D term, this one in particular, is the Kalar uh, potential. It's just uh, some terminology. Notice in the D term, we have the, um, 
for the chiral for the chiral um, super multiplet, we have the 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 kinetic the kinetic term for the for the scalar field and the kinetic term for the fermionic field for the Weyl fermion. So notice that in, in this uh, in this piece we don't have uh, we have we don't have a kinetic term for f. So the f that that scalar f is the auxiliary field because it doesn't have a kinetic term. It's not propagating. Okay. Okay. Uh, if no questions, I will go through the gauge or vector superfield. So the. For the gauge and vector superfield, we have a reality condition. So the, the, the field is real, superfield, uh, there is a re reality condition which defines it. And in particular, there will be a, 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 an un, a super gauge transformation, a billion super gauge transformation. Remember that uh, the gauge transformation, for the ordinary gauge transformation, you would take uh, a vector field and you would transform it by the derivative of some, okay. So there was a scalar. There was a there was a scalar function. So this parameter alpha depended on space time. This means local transformation. So it's a scalar field. So a billion super gauge transformation would be changing the the, the super field by the real part of the chiral super field. This is a chiral super field. Okay. So now you can do this uh, uh, gauge transformation and fix and go to a, to a very specific gauge. And this is called the West Zumino gauge, for example, and it will have these terms. So again, the components will be. Um, so the, the, these are the so these are the the, the 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 expansion in theta and theta bar, and the components will be just ordinary fields. So for example, this guy here is the real vector field. For example, photon. So it's a spin one massless vector with left and right polarization. And this guy and, and that guy, they are a Majorana spinner. You have to make a, 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 um, a scalar, Lorentz scalar, right? And uh, this guy here is some auxiliary field. This D is in the auxiliary field. So in the vector super multiplet, uh, so we have a real vector field and a Majorana field and the auxiliary D field. And the vector super multiplet is related to the vec uh, ve vector super field is what gives the vector super multiplet, gives rise to vector super multiplets. One can construct from a vector super field, one can construct a, a field strength super field, which will have the, the gauge invariant field strength, F mu nu. Okay. And with these ingredients, we can uh, formulate a, a super symmetric version of quantum electrodynamics. So let's see the, how, how would uh, a SUSY version of QED look like. So uh, to explain the electron field, we know that Q, first of all, QED is vector-like theory. So we have a left-handed electron and the right-handed electron. Therefore, we need two chiral superfields, this guy and that guy, which will which would have so both chirality, and they would have opposite electric charges. Q. We are. We want to have a, 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 um, the the a gauge anomaly free theory, vector-like theory. QED is a vector-like theory. So if you require U1 gauge invariance, you you will have to introduce a vector a vector superfield. This is the SUSY invariant Lagrangian. Okay. Uh, the first term is the mass for the for the for the for electron, for instance, this is just phi plus phi minus, and this is the the gauge transformation. So remember, uh, we are doing gauge transformation by this parameter lambda. This super, it's also it's, it, it it depends on on uh, it's a local transformation. It depends on the on the on the super coordinate. Okay. Lambda depends on super. So this term is invariant, and we want to take. So in our Lagrangian, we want to pick the uh, 
we take the F term of this, okay? Do we want to have Susie and gauge invariant uh, term Lagrangian? This term here, uh, in order to make phi dagger phi um, gauge invariant, we need to put the connection, this, um, we have to put the, 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 the vector field. Remember the vector field transforms in the exponent. It transforms as V plus I lambda minus uh, I lambda star. Okay. Uh, from here, it's, uh, the, the, so that's, that's how the vector field transforms. So it has to go in the exponent, okay? And, uh, and then finally, this piece is just the, the, the supersymmetric analog of the, of the, of the gauge, um, of, the, of the kinetic term for the gauge field. Uh, sorry, let me ask just one question. Yes, please go ahead. So in this uh, second term in the middle, where mm -hmm. you have pi dagger plus, yes. and then you, so the vector field is in the exponent, but uh, how would we practically calculate anything? Would we have to, I don't know, take this into a serious expansion and then get, I don't know, a lot of uh, interaction terms or? Ah, uh, uh, so the point is that the, 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 you have these Grassmann uh, variables and the expansion would uh, stop. Ah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, uh, and in fact, you will have only renormalizable terms up to dimension four. Yeah, yeah. So, oh. so, so um, the mass dimension of this vector superfield is actually zero. This is why it can be exponentiated. You know, the, the canonical dimension, you can look into the details, but the canonical dimension of the, of the vector superfield is zero. The, the, right, so, so you can say, are there any non-renormalizable interactions? When I do component wise, will I generate dimension five, dimension six terms? You can convince yourself that the answer is no. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, thank you. So you can remove the auxiliary fields by the equations of motion. So first we will remove those F and D guys, and then uh, you can expand that Lagrangian. So this is Susie and gauge invariant Lagrangian, and this is what you get. This is the Lagrangian of the uh, um, uh, the, the scale of the supersymmetric quantum electrodynamics. <clears throat> If you did not pay attention to this ma mathematics so far, maybe you should, uh, uh, at this point, maybe you should start uh, paying attention because at this point I will just talk ordinary non susi language. <clears throat> so let's see what we have in this Lagrangian. I will go term by term. This thing is the, is the, is the kinetic term for the gauge field. This thing is the kinetic term for the super partner of the gauge field, which we've called gauge geno. It's a Majorana fermion. This is the, the usual fermion. This is electron. <clears throat> this is the interaction of the electron with the photon, the usual one from QED. This is the mass of the electron. This is the kinetic term for the electron partner, uh, selectron supersymmetric uh, partner the, the scalar guys we have uh, we have two of them because we have two chiral fields there are two complex uh, scalars notice their mass term they have the same mass as the electron remember they are in the same multiplet uh, notice that there is no mass term for the photon and photino Gagino is for, uh, in this case Fotino. So they are both massless. Photon and Fotino are massless, while electron and selectrons are um, um, are massive and have the same mass m. Okay. Then let's let's move on. Now we go through the scalar QED. The scalar is interacting with the photon. Remember, scalar QED has quartic uh, and, um, and triple interaction with the derivative. So these three are scalar QED. Um, uh, 
Now we we have uh, the, the 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 we have to, we come to the scalar cortex. This is the, this is this is scalar cortex. These are things of this type. No. What is really funny here is that the the quartic coupling is related to the gauge coupling. This is what super supersymmetry does. So these are quartic couplings between uh, between scalars. And the final row is the interaction between the scalar selectron with the with the with the with the electron and gay genome. Okay. So this is this is selectron photino electron coupling. This is peculiar to 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 um, supersymmetry, which supersymmetry gives you this. Photino electron electron coupling, and this in, in ordinary uh, in ordinary theory, this kind of interactions uh, you would call Yukawa interactions. So this is a scalar, this is a fermion, and this is also a fermion. Uh, so this is this is just Yukawa interactions. And notice another thing is that uh, Yukawa interactions are all also given by the charge. Q. Let me clear all of this. And if I were to ask you the following, okay, I, I will give you the um, a fermionic field. I will give you scalar fields. Um, and I will tell you, please, please write down the, the, there is a U1 gauge symmetry. There is a charge Q. Uh, the, the charge is the same for this complex two complex scalar and for the Dirac fermion. And could you please write down all the interactions which are renormalizable, consistent with the Poincaré and the gauge symmetry? You would write down many terms. For example, uh, you would write down these quartic interactions, and this quartic coupling will be completely independent of the charge. It will just be just some, some new input parameter in your theory. Like the quartic in the standard model is just... Uh, also, Yukawa interactions. You, the, the Yukawa interactions and the quartics would be some input parameters. And also, it will be, there will be, it will be, be different. Like, uh, the, uh, you know, there will, each Yukawa would be independent. Each quartic would be independent input parameter. Supersymmetry is a very powerful symmetry. It tells you, uh, you see, this example of supersymmetric QED, it connects the gauge coupling. Uh, it connects the, the Yukawa and the quartix to the gauge coupling. It tells you, uh, it, it dictates, you know, the, it, it's a very powerful symmetry, which gives you additional relations between the couplings. I, I hope that this point is clear. This is actually what will uh, be crucial to the, the hierarchy problem. All right, and then you can have a look at the different uh, uh, super, sim super QED Feynman rules. Do you have any questions about this point? I think this point is crucial. How supersymmetry connects different terms in the Lagrangian. Okay, I will stop sharing this one and um, go to the other one. Okay, so uh, remember the Higgs hierarchy problem. For example, um, the, the correction to the Higgs self energy um, for coming from the top quark, we're quadratically, we're sensitive uh, quadratically to the new physics scale. Okay, and we had this interaction between the Higgs and the, the quark, and there is, there is this lambda f, which is the Yukawa coupling. So, how does supersymmetry solve this problem? So first of all, supersymmetry introduces super partners. So in addition to the, to the fermion F, okay, that couples to the Higgs, there will be fermion, its super partner, which is spin uh, zero, okay? The chiral uh, super multiplet, which will also talk to the Higgs which, with some coupling. So this is the, this lambda F tilde. 
um, I will come to, to the relation between lambda f and lambda f tilde. And we know that supersymmetry is broken. So there will be this piece here. Can you see me pointing the, 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 the second term? This yes. AF, a okay, the, 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 this AF, this actually breaks supersymmetry. The first thing, the term preserved is, it comes from the supersymmetry preserving. The second one is breaking. And this one will give a mass to the, to the, to the, to the super partner. This is called the soft breaking because it goes with the relevant operator. Relevant mean, meaning that uh, uh, dimension less than four. So in fact, this is dimension three because this is scalar, scalar, scalar. This is uh, the, the, the A has mass dimension one, okay. So the, the point is that at very high energies, these operators will not be so important, but at very low energies, they are relevant, okay. Uh, this is called soft breaking. In any, anyways, um, what do we do? So we have to call, we have additional diagrams because supersymmetry introduced additional particles. These are the additional contributions to the Higgs self energy. Now you, you take, you, you, have, you, you have to include them, all of these contributions to the, to the self energy of the Higgs. And notice what, what happens is that if lambda F tilde, coupling to spermions is minus lambda f square, then the, the, the sum is free of quadratic divergences. And supersymmetry imposes this relation exa exa exactly this relation. Remember the, 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 the QED, Susie QED example, where quartic and the Yukawa was connected to the gauge coupling. So all the couplings were connected with the same parameter. So supersymmetry imposes uh, the, the, the connection. Uh, so th this might seem like a miracle, but if in fact it, it is not, um, you are putting in the same multiplet, super multiplet, you are putting a boson and the fermion. And we know that fermionic uh, mass is protected in the top sense from, the, from these uh, quadratic divergences. Um, and even more, if you are more interested in this, um, even more deep is the go explanation goes under the name of the non-renormalization theorem in supersymmetry. It, it's, a, it's, it's a very ni nice subject that one can, one, one should have a look. But, but, but this is, in, in simple terms, this is how the, the SUSI solves the problem. First, it introduces new partners. So there are new, new diagrams. And not only that, it relates the couplings between Higgs with the top and Higgs with stop in precisely such a way to cancel the quadratic divergence in the loop. Okay. That's how it works. Another tiny detail is that uh, the, the soft SUSY breaking parameter A, which was there to give the mass to the spermion, does not enter the cancellation. So the, the cancellation of quadratic divergence doesn't depend on that uh, on that pa that parameter. So this means that uh, so you you are solving the hierarchy problem above the mass of this guy. So above its mass of this uh, super uh, spermion, um, the loops between particles and antiparticles would cancel out the quadratic divergence. So from that scale on, your theory is uh, is safe. Uh, you don't have a hierarchy problem. The only hierarchy that you have to think about is the little hierarchy between the Higgs and supersymmetric pa uh, partner, the mass of this uh, spermion, okay? Um, so what is the MSSM, the minimal supersymmetric standard model? Um, so what do you do? You take the standard model, you have to add another Higgs doublet. The reason is that um, when you promote the, the, the fields to super fields, when you supersymmetrize your theory, uh, the Higgs is a scalar. It will, it, it's in the, it will be part of the chiral super multiplet. So it will, it will have, um, there will be additional chiral fermion, Higgsino, okay? And you will have gauge anomaly because you start from the anomaly free theory, you, you will get, the, so you have to introduce another Higgs doublet with opposite gauge charge in order to have a, a anomaly free theory. 
So in fact, you start with the two Higgs doublet model, standard model plus another Higgs. Then you supersymmetrize it in a minimal way, n equal one supersymmetry. Then you impose the R parity, this discrete Z2 parity. Otherwise you would have problems with proton decays. And then uh, you need to break supersymmetry from, for, from phenomenological reasons, we haven't observed it. Then you break the supersymmetry with, with, in, in a soft way, meaning you only put uh, scalar masses or gay genome masses or the scalar trilinear couplings. And this is MSSM. The MSSM has, this is the, 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 the chiral, the superfield content. So in the, the chiral superfields are the, the usual Q, U, D, L, E, the fermionic guys and the, the two Higgses. Note that they, the two Higgses have a different U1 charge. <clears throat> and the gauge fields are put in a vector, um, in a vector supermultiplet. Okay. So the MSSM is really uh, the benchmark for beyond the standard model physics. For many, many years, you know, people consider this as, you know, the most important benchmark theory beyond the standard model. Uh, and has some really fantastic features. For example, it solves the hierarchy problem. Um, this R parity, which was needed to protect proton decay, it uh, gives you automatically uh, a candidate for dark matter. And in fact, you can realize the WIMP miracle, weakly interacting massive particle through thermal freeze out mechanism. It is the vanilla, you know, uh, dark matter that we can think of. Then uh, you can sort of fairly generically get electroweak symmetry breaking that we observe by radiative corrections, which drive the mass of the uptight Higgs to the negative value. So you could even have a rationale for the electroweak symmetry breaking. Then you can do baryogenesis. You can explain the, the matter antimatter asymmetry. MSSM can meet the Sakharov conditions, unlike the standard model. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot do any much about the flavor puzzle, but you don't, you typically don't have the new physics flavor problem. For example, if you have a specific type of SUSY breaking called gauge mediation, you, it, it predicts minimal flavor violation at low energies, uh, meaning that you can have states close to the TV scale and not uh, um, induce large flavor changing neutral currents. Finally, what I really like about supersymmetry is the following. It is the, 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 the grand unification of forces. So in the standard model, we have this U1 charge, which is just a phase. And um, we see from, from, from experiments that these are some rational numbers. For example, proton has the same as an opposite charge as the electron. And this, uh, to many people, this this uh, consistency of gauge anomaly cancellation is actually a hint that we can put the, 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 the particles, the, the, the standard model representations into a, a larger irreducible representation of a single non-abelian gauge group. So there would not be a three groups like SU3, SU2, U1, but one big grand unified uh, group. So the gauge couplings, if you go to very high energies, if you run up, they would eventually merge into a single coupling, SU5, for example. Um, and in the standard model, if you do the running with the standard model uh, field content, you would miss that uh, they don't, uh, okay. But in the MSSM, they, just, just MSSM, they miracle, low scale MSSM around the TEV, they, um, unify to the gauge couplings unify. There is a hint for unification from the, uh, from, from the MSSM. And uh, uh, I was really fascinated about this subject during my PhD. And this is a link to, to, to my uh, homework uh, from uh, uh, 2012 on the subject of, of grand unification. So MSSM really has many nice features. Other motivations for supersymmetry would be supergravity. If you, supersymmetry is a global transformation. Remember that epsilon did not depend on, on X. 
But if you, you can gauge it, if you gauge it, uh, you get something which is called SUGRA and it's a low energy theory of gravity. <clears throat> and also supersymmetry plays a critical role in string theory. It's in basis of, uh, and the string theory is one of the most uh, um, celebrated uh, framework to, to, to go to the quant quantized gravity. So supersymmetry is all, all, all over the, the place. And uh, clearly it was the prime target for the LHC searches. This is one of the searches where you produce a stop, which decays to top and uh, neutralino. And neutralino being the, the, the neutral component of um, uh, gauge, uh, neutral component of um, so gauginos and uh, higsino. It's a, it's, a, it's a mixture, the lightest one. So, so this gives you some signatures. You can go after and look for it in the experiment. This, these are some of the latest results by Atlas. These are the exclusion limits in the mass of the, of the, of the top partner stop versus the mass of Neutralino. And so they don't see any sign of supersymmetry in the experiment that the LHC, they put very stringent limits. For example, for some particles, some types of gluinos, the limits go up to uh, 2.3 TeV, where we are making the little hierarchy problem worse. Yeah, so that's all what I had to say. I'm sorry for the rush in the, in the, in the second part. Supersymmetry is super beautiful. It's a benchmark for beyond the standard model, but there is this issue that uh, our friends, uh, experimentalists don't, don't see it at the LHC.